Um, tonight's unit is Unit 9 and uh, Unreal Listening. So this is part of tonight's session, is part of the uh, unit on communication skills, personal communication skills, and tonight's real listening. And just from your notes, a introduction. It seems strange to have to talk about communication at all. It seems so commonplace. The reason we must, of course, is because it's such, it is such an important and universal aspect of human culture. We all communicate, but most of us don't do it very well. Number one, what do we mean by communication? So your fill-in is communication. Communication is the transfer of information from one person to another. We can inform others of our ideas, emotions, thoughts, moods, spiritual condition, etc., by sharing ourselves with them. But true communication only unfolds when the message that is sent is the same message that is received. Most of us assume the other person has heard it the same way as we intended, but that is seldom true. Have you ever played that uh, party game where you stand in a circle and you whisper something in somebody's ear? And I thought about doing that with you people, and that's what the little thing there is. What I was going to whisper into one person's, the, the, the first person's ear, was money, elephant, green, swim. And, and I was going to see what was going to come out the end, if all of you were in a circle. But since we're a little behind time, I won't do that tonight. But it'd be interesting. I, I, I doubt very much that you'd get the same four words in the same order at the other end. Okay? So communication is, is when I send a message, not from your notes just for the moment, is when I send a message and the very same message has been received. So how do they do it in, uh, like, airplanes? You know, I don't know if you've ever listened. My dad used to have a shortwave radio, and I'd listen to the planes landing at the airport, and, and uh, you know, the control tower would say, uh, uh, l you know, land at one niner niner, and, you know, they'd go on and roger dodger and all this sort of stuff. How do they do that? The control tower says land at 199, which means, or they use the word nine or niner for some reason, and uh, which means the compass bearing. So that's the, the landing strip is facing in that compass bearing. And uh, what does the pilot do? Right. Hey, that's right, he feeds it back. He says, Roger, land at, uh, you know, strip 199, one niner niner. Right? And then what would the control tower say? Roger, Roger and out. So, uh, I, uh, so somebody sends a message, somebody receives it, they feed it back, and then the person that sent the message has to agree that the message that was sent and the message that was fed back is exactly the same. So communication does not take place unless both people agree. But how many of us do that? You know, hey, mom, I'm going to the, uh, I'm going to the store. Or I'm going here, I'm going there. You know? Or dad, hey, you know, I'm, I'm just off to see my boyfriend. I mean, we assume that because we sent the message that the other person's received it. You know, but that's not the case, is it? Especially with males and females. You know? Big difference with the message that's being sent and the message that's being received. And the reason for that's this. Um, let's say that um, I speak only German. Okay, I only speak German, and my wife only speaks English, for argument's sake, okay? Now, there's a really important message I want to send her. In fact, let's, let's not make it husband and wife, okay? There's a business partner, and I'm German, he only knows English, and I only know German, and the message I have to send this guy is so important that if he doesn't get it, I'm going to lose a million bucks. Okay? Now, what language do I send it in? Remember, I'm, I'm, I only speak German, he only speaks English, and he has to get a message from me that will cause us to not lose a million dollars. What language do I send it in? That's right. I'd either have to get it translated, or I would have to learn English. Now, this goes to male and female. If a female wants to send a message to a male, what language should she send it in? Male language. That's right. That's right. 
If I'm a female and I want to send a male a message, I better translate it into something he can understand. And if I'm a male, vice versa, and I want to send a message to a female, I better learn to send it in a language she can understand, or no communication is going to take place. Now, how many do that? Well, they don't, and that's why I get. Uh, that's why I'm going to be full-time business marriage counseling for the rest of my life. Okay, number two, communication is the basis of all relationships. Communication is the basis of all relationships. The transfer of information doesn't have to be just in verbal or written words. We can communicate with facial expressions, body movements, the intonation of our voice, etc. We will have time only to briefly introduce you to some of these other forms of communication. Many domestic fights start over lack of communication. Indeed, many wars between nations start over poor communication. In this course, we will cover personal communication skills, but not other types of communication, such as management skills, communication in groups, skills in diplomacy, preaching and teaching, and so on. In this unit, we will focus on the communication skills necessary for good relationships. These are not skills we're born with. Rather, they have to be learned in practice. Or some people like to say they have to be caught and taught. The sad thing about most families is that relationship and communication skills are not taught very well. How many of you had parents that taught you how to communicate with the opposite sex? That said to you, now, when you're talking to a female, this is what you say and this is how you say it. Or if you're talking to a male, this is how you say it, this is how you approach it. How many of you had parents that deliberately taught you how to do that? Hands up. One. One person. Sad, isn't it? You know, I mean, all this friction, 40% divorce rate, because we're not doing it. You know, I might add from a Christian perspective that we're not teaching our kids how to pray either. We are not teaching our kids to have a living relationship with Jesus. We're teaching them all the rules and regulations, the Ten Commandments, but where's the relationship? You know, we haven't introduced our kids to Jesus, really. I mean, we've introduced them to Christianity and rules and regulations, but what about relationship? Number three, without good relationships, we cannot be content. So the fill in there is content or happy. McKay puts it this way, who's one of the authors that, that we'll give you a bibliography for. Your ability to communicate largely determines your personal happiness. When you communicate effectively, you make and keep friends. You are valued at work. Your children respect and trust you. You get your sexual needs, needs met. Okay, that's this person's uh, comment. B, Jesus communicated effectively. Jesus communicated effectively. You know, there's lots of stories in the Bible about Jesus and uh, about his communication styles. Um, but one, one I think that's uh, valued, valuable is the one about the woman at the well. So let's just look at this. Jesus was someone who could effectively connect with people who were willing to listen. He could read people's hearts and so knew exactly where they were coming from. One of the great stories of the Bible is Jesus at the village well talking to a Samaritan woman. Remember the story? Let me just read it out to you. So we're looking at... Uh, John 4. Um, let's let's uh, go down to... Um, um, yeah, we can start from the beginning. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. 
It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Okay, now let's just stop there and uh, just follow our notes a little bit as well. Notice that Jesus starts out the conversation with a loving but challenging request. Will you give me a drink? She chastises him for asking her to do something that the Jews did not approve of, a Samaritan associating with a Jew and a woman talking to a strange man. So really, this is unheard of. You know, you, you did not do this in that culture. Two things wrong. One is a Samaritan and a Jew talking. You know, I mean, you know, the Samaritans to the Jew, uh, Jews were uh, like the low caste in India. You know, you just you, you shunned them. You didn't talk to them. Uh, you treated them like dirt. Um, they were mixed race. They weren't pure. Uh, you know, they were half Babylonian and all that sort of stuff. Right. So that's the first thing. You'd never catch a Jew and a Samaritan having a civil conversation uh, in, in public. The second thing, of course, is was uh, uh, if you're talking to a strange woman, uh, what's the only time really you'd ever talk to a strange woman in that culture? If you wanted her services, if she was a prostitute. So, you know, you, you know it, wasn't, it wasn't a done thing to be talking to a woman, a strange woman. You just didn't do that. You had your, you, you know... The, the, the etiquette was, if you wanted to talk to some woman, you talked to her husband. See? So Jesus has just violated two of the basic rules of etiquette here. Now, he asked her to draw him uh, some water. And, uh, and uh, you know, now she didn't, I mean, that total shock. She would have been in total shock. This Jewish man is asking her to draw him some water. Okay, let's see what he does, see what he says. Um, first of all, of course, she rebukes him. Uh, and he, his disciples have gone into town to buy food, so no one else is around uh, to witness this. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Okay, now... Is that a natural answer Jesus has given to her or a spiritual answer? That's a spiritual one. But notice, they're not connecting here, are they? I mean, look at what she says. Uh, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his flocks and herds? Of course, she is exalting Jacob. I mean, you know, this is he's one of the big guys in the faith, you see. So, uh, says, are you greater than this man? I mean, Jacob's well would have been well known around that, that you know, all of, uh, all of uh, uh, that district, all of Israel, in fact. Okay, Jesus responds with a riddle. This is from our notes here. He deliberately talks on a different level to her to force her out of her limited mindset. Jesus talks to her in spiritual terms while she keeps responding naturally. Communication hasn't taken place yet, as both are on different wavelengths. Okay, just back to Scripture, verse 13. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So is she still in tune yet? No, no, she's thinking, you know, here's this everlasting, you know, spring, like Hepburn Springs. That must be what Jesus is talking about. Some well that you don't have to draw water from. I think my, uh, this thing's just sagging a bit here. Sorry about this tape. Okay, now, um, let's see what Jesus does next. Um, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Okay, what would we call that in modern language? Word of knowledge, isn't it? 
Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Pretty astounding. So, did they connect in the end? Yes, they did. Just back to our notes. When Jesus gives her word of knowledge about her many husbands and the de facto relationship she has at the moment, he really gets her attention. She leaves the fear of talking to the strange Jewish man behind and hears Jesus for the first time. Both of them then talk on the same wavelength, and the story unfolds. I don't think Jesus did anything accidentally here. I think this was a whole, the whole thing was a setup, if I can put it that way. You know, right from the beginning, uh, Jesus uh, knew her heart, knew where she was at, knew that she was going to be responsive, um, and, uh, and, uh, but, but, you know, she just wasn't going to connect. There was this huge gulf between them. So how does this, how does this uh, uh, man who's truly God and truly man at the same time connect with this human being that's already in awe of him? I mean, here's a, he's a Jewish man, you know, I mean, it's like a king talking to you in their terms. You know, how's he going to make that rapport? How's he going to connect? And Jesus did it. Okay, um, let's go on to see real listening. So C is real listening. Human beings are notoriously bad listeners. Those of us who like to talk don't listen well. But even if we aren't talking, we may be off in our own little world, listening to ourselves rather than the other person. One of the first things we have to do to establish or enhance a relationship is to listen well to the other person. This can be difficult if we haven't been trained to listen or in such an emotional upheaval that's near impossible. Now, remember I, I've used a little parable with you before. When is a thief no longer a thief? Now, uh, if he just stops stealing, uh, uh, he, he could be uh, afraid of getting caught. Or, you know, his fence is uh, busy with too many goods to flog. So a thief isn't a thief when he stops stealing. A thief is no longer a thief when he starts giving away TV sets instead of stealing them. In other words, where does the change have to happen? In the heart, right? In the heart. His heart has to change so that greed's not there. I mean, a thief is really a greedy person, trying to do least amount of work uh, for the greatest amount of gain. Okay, well, when is somebody a good listener? When they stop talking? Can I stop talking and, and be a good listener? I can, but the, the two aren't necessarily the same, are they? I mean, uh, you could be talking to me and I'm not talking at all, but my brain's off on another planet. I'm thinking about my computer, you know, while I'm talking to you. That's right. Okay, so uh, it's going to it's going to show up if I've got the right kind of heart attitude, and and there's going to be a behavior just like the thief not stealing anymore, but giving away TV sets when uh, I am in, in, when I'm trying to uh, pull out of you what you're trying to say. I'm actually going to try to encourage you, and instead of just being a passive listener, I'm going to actually pull those words out of your mouth, saying, "Listen, I'm really interested. I'm, I'm going to give you the impression." that I'm really interested, I want to hear what you've got to say. Okay, now I'm going to, if we, if, we um, if we want real contact, I'm going to have to reflect back to you so that you know that I'm on the same track that you are. And we'll look at how we do that. That's what this unit's all about, is looking at those sort of issues. Okay, but just being quiet, it doesn't make me a listener. Definitely not. Okay, let's go on to D. Why really listen? Why 
really listen? Well, number one, it is a selfish act not to. Why is it a selfish act not to listen? Well, I'm to love my neighbor as myself, so I mean, I'm supposed to invest in other people. You know, God's into relationships. Number two, the Bible tells us to. I mean, that's a good enough reason right there, because the Bible tells us to listen. Quote from James, Dear brothers, don't ever forget that it's best to listen much, speak little, and not become angry. There's another saying, I think it is in Proverbs, but basically the implication is this. Um, why, um, let me see if I can get this right. Why have somebody think that I'm a fool and then open my mouth and prove it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, but I'm on tape, David. Yes. That's, that's good. Yeah, we've got two ears and one mouth and we should use in that proportion. That's good. Excellent. I think that's exactly right. And by the way, all you fellows here that are married, what's the most important organ you can give your wife? Your ears. And they have a right to chew on them as long as they need to. They have a right to chew on them as long as they need to. And some men come to me and they say, uh, look, you know, my wife, she does waffle on, man. After a while, I just put my ear, you know, fingers in my ears and, you know, I just can't take it anymore. And, uh, uh, you know, um, I said to him, well, there was a lady that came to see Susan and me that talked for four and a half hours straight without a break. We didn't say anything for four and a half hours. You know, the second time she came, uh, she talked for three hours straight. The next time she came, she talked for two hours straight. See the see where it's heading? Now, the lady is uh, happily married now. Uh, they've just had a baby, uh, re reconciliation baby in this marriage, and they're just going great guns. And, and she probably needs 20 minutes a day for, for her dose, if I can put it that way, of, of listening to keep her feeling secure. See, part of it is, if my wife thinks she can chew my ears anytime she needs to, then she doesn't need to anymore. You know, there's a certain amount of safety and security in the fact that she knows that I'll be there if she wants me. So, uh, let them chew on your ears, guys. Number three, listening is a loving act. Listening is a loving act. Number four, real listening means being interested in someone. Real listening means being interested in someone. The book Messages says this, and I recommend you read that. Uh, we've got uh, at least one copy downstairs in the counseling center. Uh, read back book. Uh, anyone going to Tabor will probably have to read that for their counseling course, um, if they're still d using that. Um, it's a textbook on good communication. Being quiet, quote, being quiet while someone talks does not constitute real listening. Real listening is based on the intention to do one of four things. A, understand someone. Understand someone for A. B, enjoy someone. C, learn something. D, give help or a solace. So A, understand. B, enjoy. C, learn. D, give help. Yes, Elizabeth. Speaking of uh, teenagers, when they're really upset, they know you never listen to them. Yes. And it's true. It is true sometimes. Well, I mean, you know, in some ways it's pretty natural because we're all busy people, and uh, so we're wanting to get things done. I mean, one of the, you know, if you read the book Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, one of the major points uh, Gray makes is that guys are Mr. Fixits. 
You know, we're so intent on trying to fix the problem here uh, and get a solution going uh, that we're, you know, we don't sit and listen to, to really uh, what our wives have to say. And some of the time, there's nothing to fix. It's just letting off steam. You know, I give the example of, uh, you know, if I went to Jeff and said to Jeff, Jeff, I'm angry. Jeff, quite rightly, would assume that I'm angry at him. And the reason being, in male culture, most men would not discuss feelings of a third party. See, most men, if, if, if a man approached me, I could pretty much assume, if he says, I'm really angry, that most men would be talking about being angry toward me. That's how it is in male culture. You know, we're not, we don't tend to go around talking about how angry I am at a third party. But ladies, on the other hand, and I'm not saying that everybody's like this, but just the majority are. Uh, but ladies, on the other hand, if, if Susan comes to me and says, I'm really angry, first thing I'd do, of course, is get defensive. You know, what have I done now? Say. But she might be talking about the mailman or her sister or, you know, her teacher or whoever. See. But the problem is because there's this clash of male and female cultures here. And there's a misunderstanding straight away. Now, some ladies uh, get around that by saying immediately when they've started letting go of their feelings, but hang on, this is not about you, Fred, you know, and then they just keep on turning away. Because another thing that Dr. Gray says, which I think is true, is that some, some ladies like to build the suspense a bit when they're telling a good story, mm. you know? <laughs> and you don't get the punchline until the end, say. And in the meantime, these confused men are going, you know, I don't remember doing that, you know? And they're actually talking about somebody completely different because they're building the story up. Instead of saying now, Fred, I'm not talking about you, I'm talking about, you know, Joe here, but this is how the story goes. Well, it sort of defeats, you know, the whole build-up, you see. So, a clash of cultures. Okay, let's go on. E, what are blocks to real listening? What are blocks to real listening? Sometimes we are too self-centered, other times we're too fact-centered rather than person-centered. In any event, we often put up barriers to real communication. Following are some of these self-imposed barriers. One, preoccupied with self. Preoccupied with self. Often we're so concerned with our own issues and problems that we find it difficult to give the other our full attention. Following are some subgroups of this blockage. Now, this whole section here, I want you to sort of uh, take in, because your homework assignment is going to be to work out which of these blocks you use. So I'll get you to reread this after we've gone through it once, and I'm going to ask you to write down which of these blocks you use. And you'll find that you use different blocks with different people. So, you know, Dan Tangler's going to use a particular block with my mother. Not listening, Mom, you know, compared to a different block with Susan, and so on. So it'll be interesting to see which blocks you use with which people. Okay, the first one. Uh, a, inadequate listening. So preoccupied with self we're talking about here. Inadequate listening. We may, we may be tired or sick, but certainly involved with our own thoughts for various reasons. Now, pretty understandable. I mean, if you're sick and you got the flu and, you know, you're really not tuned in, I mean, it's pretty normal. But, uh, you know, but communication is going to be hindered. And so don't be surprised if something goes wrong. B, mind reading. Mind reading. We're too busy trying to figure out what the other person is thinking or feeling to really listen. I've got a few counselees at the moment that probably the biggest problem they've got is trying to work out people's motivations. They're spending huge amount of energy trying to work out everybody's motivation. Now, why did so-and-so say that to me at church? And why did my husband do this? And da-da-da-da-da. You know? And they're going nuts. They're going nuts trying to work it all out. And one person asked me and said to me, you mean you don't think like that? And I said, no. And they were astonished. You know, there's there, just so much going on in this he, in these heads that uh, you know how can they listen? 
fully occupied uh, wondering about all these things. The third one, C, is rehearsing. Rehearsing. This block occurs when we're thinking about what we want to say next instead of listening effectively. Okay, so those are just three under the, under the heading of preoccupied with self. Now, I'm not saying that, I mean, we all use all of these sometimes, right? The problem is, if, if, if I've got a habit pattern of using a particular block most of the time, that's the trouble. Number two, filter. Okay, number two is filtering. This is when we let our minds wander when we're about to hear something negative, boring, critical, or unpleasant. We only tune into the things that interest us. Three, judging. This is putting labels on people rather than situations. When we write off someone or put them into a pigeonhole, we will start judging what they say. Putting a judgment on a person is a major roadblock to good communication. The Bible has this to say, don't criticize and then you won't be criticized, for others will treat you as you treat them. And, you know, um, just before we go on, judgment is, um, is a huge issue in our, in our Christian walk. And uh, you might remember in Romans it says, um, who art thou, man, who judgest? Romans chapter 2. Because you who judge do the very same things. Now, remember that judging um, causes the, uh, a cutoff of love. When the other person it can feel, well, will feel, cut off from your love that is in rejection if you are judging them. And um, my job is to tell truth to people and uh, let them um, make their own decisions. So I can't force anybody to do anything. And uh, judging is only going to boomerang. It's only going to stop the flow of love. It's only going to damage relationships. Okay, just back to your notes. But please be aware that discernment, that is judging of situations or character, is encouraged by Scripture. Hebrews 5 says, But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Uh, and in Matthew 7 it says, And yes, the way to identify a tree or person is by the kind of fruit produced. That's the living Bible. So I'm allowed to judge in the sense of being a fruit inspector. I am allowed to judge what kind of fruit people are producing. That's different from pigeonholing them or judging their motivations. Um, criticism, I'll just throw this out for you. Criticism is discernment with unforgiveness. I'll say that again. Criticism is discernment with unforgiveness. Now, as a counselor, I have to have discernment. If I don't have discernment, we're not going to get very far. But I'm entitled to tell people truth, but I have to say it in a non-judgmental way. Uh, you know, Jesus was just brilliant at this. Um, that's one of the things the Pharisees could not understand, is how this man could hang around sinners. What did these sinners see in Jesus? But they loved him. The sinners loved Jesus because he was non-judgmental. And as a human being, as a Christian, and as a counselor, I'm called to be non-judgmental. And you know, if I don't uh, uh, release other people to be different from me, then what will happen is uh, that I'll judge them, uh, they will feel cut off from my love, and, uh, and, and they'll react to that. Okay, let's go on. Judging comprises a large group of similar attitudes. Some of the subgroups are, A, comparing ourselves with others. Okay, comparing ourselves with others. Dangerous thing to be comparing ourselves with others. 
I mean, aside from bad communication, um, very dangerous. I mean, uh, different people have different skills and different abilities, and I'm going to be in big trouble if I'm comparing myself to others. And of course, some of these things are what people come to counseling for. This list that I'm about to read out is, in fact, why people need counseling, because they do these things. So please be aware that these are not helpful. Be criticizing, which I've just talked about. Discernment with unforgiveness. C, name-calling. So B is criticizing. C is name-calling. You know, name-calling as in, you know, uh, calling people pigs and whatnot. That's not going to make good conversation, is it? Good communication. D, diagnosing. Diagnosing or evaluative, evaluative listening. In other words, I'm coming across like a doctor uh, who's uh, um, taking every little bit they say, taking, ripping it to shreds, and 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 uh, and uh, turning it into a clinical exercise instead of two human beings discussing things. E. Flattery. Flattery. Now, flattery is a type of judging. You know, because if I'm flattering somebody and lying, I might add, if I'm telling somebody untruth, excuse me, untruth about their uh, situation uh, to butter them up because I don't want them to feel bad, it's manipulation, it's control, it's judging, it's lying. And if I'm a child of light, God does not encourage me to do that. Okay, F, sympathy. Sympathy or a manipulative reassurance. If I'm putting my arm around somebody and hugging them and holding on them too long, that's manipulation and control. And it's my problem. That is, um, by, by uh, sympathizing and, 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 uh, and uh, letting them uh, dwell in self-pity, that is not helpful, and it's my need that's being met here. My need to be needed uh, by having my arm around a person is, is my issue, not theirs. So be careful. Doing things for people is not love. Love is acting in the other person's best possible interest. And we'll, we'll keep saying that because a lot of people have trouble uh, understanding what real love is. Number four, daydreaming. Daydreaming. This is when we start pursuing our own chain of thoughts. Something the other person says triggers a memory and we're off into a dream world. Well, that, that's, uh, I've been guilty of that and, as a kid. My, my German aunt, I used to live in Germany for a while, and my German aunt would say I was Trainer, and, and Trainer means teardrop. And she said it for two reasons. One, because I was off into my own world out, um, you know, it doesn't translate really well, but a trainer means somebody who's very slow, you know, just like a teardrop, just sort of trickles down your cheek. Well, um, that's how I used to be, just uh, slowly going about my business while my aunt was rushing around a thousand miles an hour. And, uh, and daydreaming, you know, I was off in my own little world, um, uh, away from my home, away from my parents, and uh, and I suppose there was uh, implications of that, although I was very happy uh, being in a boarding school. Number five, identifying. Identifying. Here we relate to the other person's experience. They were bored by the opera, and we have also been in the past. When this happens, we remember our own experience and so cannot listen 100%. And you know, I'm off in my little world thinking, oh yeah, I remember that, yeah, that's right, and that's such and such a day, I was doing such and such. And, you know, the person's talking all along here and uh, haven't heard a word. Number six, advising. Advising. This is a common block for people helpers. Common block for people helpers. Common block for counselors. Um, in fact, I'd say that advising is probably the most 
uh, damaging uh, attribute for uh, counselors. That is, um, you know, a, a um, um, my job is to tell people truth, but they have to be a judge. They have to be the one that's making the decisions. And there's no way that I'm going to ever advise someone to get a divorce, for example, or for that matter, not to get a divorce when the husband's beating on them. You know, that's not my role to uh, be involved in that sort of thing. And uh, you know, I watch for that in my co-counselors, in our co-counselors at our counseling center, because that's one of the most common uh, counseling mistakes, I guess, is advising. We are so busy, just back to our notes, we are so busy trying to solve their problem that we don't really hear what they're saying. The source of trouble for them, the way they're feeling, the pain they're experiencing, you know, and, uh, and I need to be a person-centered counselor, not a um, solution-centered counselor. That is, the person is more important than the solution. Uh, that sounds a little funny, I, or can sound a little funny, but that's the truth. Often people feel, just about, on page uh, five now, often people feel alone. They just can't be when can't just be with them. You know, um, um, you know, staggered that uh, that uh, Job, and we'll talk more about this again. But uh, Job just sat with his, uh, or rather, Job's friends sat with Job for three whole days and didn't say anything. You know, that's real love, isn't it? Similar solution-oriented blockages are a ordering. So, you know, when I'm telling somebody what to do, ordering, uh, that's a solution oriented blockage to good listening. I mean, they're not going to be, li I'm not going to be listening if I'm telling them what to do. Be threatening. Now, this is, of course, where husband and wives or, or any sort of relationship uh, comes apart because uh, they are uh, threatening. And when a person's threatening me, I'm not really hearing what they've got to say. Moralizing, C, is moralizing, moralizing. Um, you know, Christian counselors can be very cr can very trite in their moralizing. You should do this and you should do that. Um, you know, if it was that simple, uh, all of us could get sorted out. But you know, it's not that simple. It's not that simple. Um, people have heart problems and... Uh, trying to get the heart uh, to do what it's supposed to be doing is not easy. And uh, just coming along and laying down the law of legalism is not going to cut it. And Jesus, God is not interested in me being perfect. He made me perfect through the work of the cross. But trying to force me to be perfect uh, is not going to uh, cause good relationship. D, excessive questioning. Excessive questioning. Uh, if I use too many questions, uh, take up too much time, then they don't have time to speak. They're going to feel left out and cut out. E, using cliches. Uh, another Christian counselor problem, using cliches. Um, uh, you know, all you got to do is this. All you got to do is that. Uh, brother, all you need is more faith. Well, if it was that easy, I tell you what, uh, you wouldn't need counselors. Uh, there wouldn't be any marriage problems. Um, uh, you know, we'd all be on track. But it's not that easy. Okay, number seven: logic that hinders communication. Logic that hinders communication. Um, I'll tell you a little story about logic that hinders communication just in a little bit. But in this block, you become enmeshed, trying to point out the folly of their ways. We become so concerned about being right that we fail to hear the other person, especially especially how they're feeling. Um, sparring is the first one. A is sparring. So, you know, verbal uh, sword fights uh, where you're trying to get to score points. Well, that's not listening. Uh, B is arguing. Um, again, you know, if you're arguing... 
uh, who's right and wrong, what, you know, what's right or wrong. You know, when people come to uh, counseling, um, you know, there's uh, uh, the husband's point of view, there's the wife's point of view, and, and they're arguing about it. Now, if I jumped in into the argument, uh, all there would be would be three opinions instead of two, so that's not, that wouldn't be helpful. C, being sarcastic, being sarcastic. Uh, sarcasm uh, is a, is a um, it can be a very damaging uh, word plays. And uh, um, a, a lot of slapstick humor is, um, you know, it can be very damaging to people. And seeing people get injured, I don't think is very funny. So I'm not a great fan of slapstick humor. Or people that are being sarcastic, the, the quick wit. Uh, I can appreciate the intelligence of it, but when it comes to relationship, being sarcastic or, or, or uh, with the quick repartee is not, uh, is not on for building good relationships. And finally, D, inappropriate logic. Uh, I've got a little story to tell you about inappropriate logic. Uh, Susan and I were um, um, traveling down to Melbourne all the way down to Collins Street because Susan was visiting a um, specialist doctor down there. And we were living in Hillsville at the time, and it would take us about two and a half hours to get down there and about two and a half hours to get back. And uh, anywhere from, you know, a 20 minute, half hour wait for this guy because he was often in court. And so, you know, he was always late. I mean, invariably late. And, uh, you know, it's pretty nerve-wracking driving through traffic and all that. So anyways, this one day we get down there, and the guy is uh, not there, and the secretary says, well, he's in court, and uh, he'll be a little bit late. And so, you know, 20 minutes go by, 40 minutes go by, an hour goes by, an hour 20, an hour 40. Two hours went by, and uh, she says, well, it doesn't look like he's coming. I tell you what, uh, just come back next week. You know, like it was just... Uh, a simple little statement by her uh, that was going to fix the problem that uh, we could just come back next week and that was it. Well, I mean, you know, we just spent two and a half hours down, two and a half hours back, um, you know, two hour wait. A whole day went by doing nothing and, and burning all that petrol <clears throat> and we lost two days pay, you know, and so needless to say, uh, you know, we weren't, uh, uh, we weren't just uh, angry. Susan was furious, absolutely furious. So driving on the way home, uh, and, and she developed a migraine as well, driving on the way home, um, uh, she is just, you know, Susan's just hopping mad, and she's going on about uh, how, um, you know, un inconsiderate this guy is and, you know, how she could wring his neck. And, uh, you know, now I wasn't pleased either, but I wouldn't say I was furious. I was probably annoyed would be probably the right word for wh where I was at, pretty laid back about it all. Uh, in some ways, and uh, I said this comment to her. Now, just catch this. I said this to her. I said, uh, Susan, I'm sure he had a good reason to uh, why he was late. Now, how do you think that made her feel? Okay, let's just uh, uh, just, just have a you know, just have a think. Put yourself in her shoes, and and tell me what you think she was actually feeling. Okay, what she was feeling. Okay, well, she was feeling betrayed, wasn't she? She felt betrayed. In her emotions, it seemed like I was with the doctor attacking her. I was on his side attacking her. That's how it seemed to her emotionally. Now, I find this probably the biggest block. You know, one of the big um, um, disaster areas in marriages. Now, of course, it doesn't have to be the woman that's the emotional one. When the male is logical, it can be uh, the, you know, the, the male being emotional and the female being logical. It doesn't matter. But the general rule is this, that whoever is logical has to enter into the emotional person's world because the emotional person cannot enter into the logical person's world at that point in time. I mean, a good example of that is I was down in Adelaide with Susan and first time in the city in Adelaide and driving around trying to find a parking spot to get to some shops, and it was pouring 
you know, pouring rain. And I didn't know the town very well on one-way streets, and I don't remember how it all goes now, but driving around, and I just about pull into a parking spot, and Susan says, no, 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 get closer, get closer. So I try to, you know, drive around the block again, drive around the block again, drive around the block again. And uh, at this point, I, I got so angry. I mean, this is the angriest I have ever been. I got so furious that I literally, my eyes blocked out. That is, I saw red, I couldn't see anything. I had to quickly pull to the side of the road, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, my vision just went. I mean, my eye, the, the, I guess my blood pressure had gone up so much that uh, my eyes could only see the, uh, you know, the, the blood in the retina, I guess, and, uh, you know, I just lost it. Yeah, how cool and collected and logical do you think I was at that point? You know, um, so, you know, watch that. That's a, a, a big trap. Number eight, diverting. Diverting. When we get uncomfortable with what we're hearing, we change the subject to something less threatening or more pleasant. There are two main methods for doing this. A, derailing. Like, you know, a railway line derailing a train by changing the subject ourselves. So if we derail somebody, uh, we change the subject so that uh, uh, we change the focus of the conversation. The second thing is placating. Placating. And uh, we do this by concurring with everything that is said. We hope the other person will change the subject, you know. Somebody's ear bashing us about the footy. We got no interest in the footy. And we just keep saying, oh, yeah, 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 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, just hoping that eventually they're just going to run out of steam and change the subject onto something more interesting. And finally, um, okay, well, that, that, uh, those are eight uh, different ways that we can uh, block good communication. And uh, now uh, uh, we're going to do a little exercise here. F, exercise one. In the space below on the next page, write down the specific kinds of blocks you tend to use. List your most commonly used blocks, more than one, for every important person in your life, such as mother, good friend, boss, etc. Okay, so what we're going to do now is take a break, and you can get yourself a cup of coffee, and uh, come back here in the room, and, and what I want you to do is put down the kinds of blocks that you use with your mother and your father and your brother and your sister and your uh, you know, best friend and your spouse and your children and so on. And, and you're going to find that you use different blocks with different people. And um, so uh, I'd like you to just do that, start that exercise now. We'll spend 10, 15 minutes on it. And then um, after, uh, as homework, I'd like you to do some work on that so that you can really identify the sort of blockages uh, that you use yourself. So let's just stop there now and take a break. Now, people uh, that are listening to this tape, um, uh, there's no more on this side. Please go to tape two. Thank you. I, I don't think I'll... Uh, We'll do a lot of sharing on the listening blocks, but just uh, just a few comments. Anybody got a funny story to tell uh, of something that maybe you just realized that uh, you use a particular block with a particular person? Anyone willing to make themselves vulnerable and share that? Is it bad if you use about six or seven against one person? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the comment was whether it's bad to use six or seven against one person. Well, well, at, le at least you're you're spreading out. You know, I mean, this is not one particular one that uh, you keep hammering. They don't get bored that way. Yeah. <coughs> I was surprised. I would have thought I was a uh, reasonable listener, but when I think about I do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. They seem to all those things seem to indicate somewhere underneath selfishness or whatever. Well, sure, sure. It's it's always selfish, but I mean the truth is we have to be sometimes. I mean if I'm not feeling well, uh, we can call that selfishness if you want. But the the truth is I just can't function, you know. And sometimes if someone's droning on and on and on, 
uh, you know, about footy and you're, you know, and you're in the AFL, the anti-football league. Well, I mean, what, what are you going to do? So, so I, I, all of us have um, coping mechanisms that ideally, I guess, from a perfect God's point of view, are sinful. Okay? But the truth is, in the, in the real world that we live in, uh, you're going to do some of those some of the time. You know? And it's the old story, uh, when do you take away someone's crutch? When the leg heals, right? You take away the crutch when the leg heals? Not before. And so some of our coping mechanisms that you might, that a, a, a godly person might call um, sinful, you still will have to use that until you're healed. And people come to me and say, uh, Daniel, I want to give up smoking. Okay, well, for some people, giving them smoking just causes them to have an addiction to something else. Well, that's no solution. And like I've told a few people, I can, I can cure anybody of alcoholism. I just uh, attach a few electrodes in the right spot, and uh, when they try to take a drink, I give them a 10,000 volt shock. And you've well, tried this out, of course. <laughs> Well, isn't that why you're not drinking anymore, Jeff? Well, <laughs> I, I would tend to beg the difficulty drink. Yeah? <laughs> I think if you give them a big enough jolt. But the, but, but the, but the, problem, the problem is, of course, that that's not a cure. See? So that's where some of the difficulties are. Okay, well, let's go on with our notes for G. Steps to effective listening. Steps to effective listening. Following are some ways to effectively listen to your partner. One, listen actively. Listen actively. This means not just hearing, but becoming involved in the conversation. A, paraphrase. Paraphrase. Now this is something, of course, that good counselors would do. That is, sum up what the person has said and give it back to them. And I try to do that maybe two or three times a session as I'm counseling, saying, okay, now let me get this straight. Uh, you know, your father beat you and, and this and that and that, and this is how, and this is, you know, how you're feeling about that. Is that right? And they say yes, and then, you know, you go on. Else was what happens in counseling. You could be way down the track and they say, well, you know, this is irrelevant to where I'm at. You know, you've just wasted an hour. Now, of course, that's important for counseling, but it's important for any sort of communication. B, clarify. Clarify. Ask questions until you understand what they mean. You know, most people do not mind me asking questions, providing I'm really interested. If they think I'm asking genuine questions because I want to understand, um, that's, uh, you know, they take that as empathy, you know, as really uh, wanting to know, and, you know, I don't want to use the word flattery after we just uh, used that word, but they're flattered in the sense that I'm interested. So, you know, with the right attitude, they don't mind you asking questions. That's actually showing that you're interested in listening. Feedback, C. C is feedback. Give your actions to what they said, both thoughts, feelings, or spiritual discernment. Now, I just had a couple people today that one of the major issues is they do not tell their partner how they're feeling. And the reason they don't do it is because they're afraid of hurting their spouse's feelings. They're afraid of hurting their spouse's feelings. And I said to them, well, you know, there's three things wrong with this. One is, how is the other person ever supposed to work out what's going on and, and deal with it properly? Secondly, uh, you're actually violating God's word that says, be angry but sin not, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. So how, how many days do I get to deal with an issue? One, the day it happens. If your brother offend you, go and see him or her. So people are violating God's rules, actually, when... They do not share, uh, you know, how they're feeling or thinking with their partner. Now, the third problem, of course, um, is that 
If I hide things from my partner, I'm in a cult. The word occult means hidden. It's in darkness. And if I'm a child of light, God expects me to be transparent. He expects me to bring everything out into the open. Now you might say, well, that might devastate my partner. Well, it might initially. But is it better to have a sharp wound that hurts a lot and then heals quickly, or is it better to have a bruise that goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on? Yes, I might injure my partner emotionally by being truthful, but, you know, the pain thing will look something like this. Better that, I, better that I've hurt them a lot in the beginning and then it t tapers off than have something like this. So, yeah, over here at the beginning, uh, it wasn't as painful, but it's this bruising, this, this underlying sense of something's not right, and a churning inside your stomach that just goes on and on and on. I mean, people aren't, most people aren't stupid. Most people are sensitive in some way, spiritually or emotionally, and they know that something's not right, whether you tell them or not. And it certainly doesn't emphasize, it doesn't uh, generate uh, integrity in honesty if people don't share honestly. Okay, let's go on. Give your reactions in to see feedback. Um, Roman numeral I, or little i. Be immediate. Be immediate. Communicate back as soon as you understand. You know, don't wait until two weeks later to respond back. You know, you've missed the moment. Respond back straight away. Two, be honest. And three, be supportive by using tactful, gentle words. Number two, listen with empathy. Listen with empathy. It is important to really understand that being human means making mistakes and feeling inadequate. We are all trying to survive, search for happiness, and we all experience pain. Jesus had compassion and empathy on those around him because he experienced our pain. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Romans chapter 4. Empathy is responding to the other person's feelings Hearing the other below the surface. Okay, that's what our, that's what empathy is. Hearing somebody below the surface. Isaiah says this: The Lord has given me His words of wisdom, so that I may know what I should say to all these weary ones. Empathy is to reflect back their feelings. The trouble is often we do not know our own feelings. So how can we hear another person's? Now, I think, I think I've got a classic in this one. Uh, uh, young man, young lady come to me for pre-marriage counseling, and the young lady is involved in, a, is involved in uh, cosmetics, okay? And she has a work party. So she works for a cosmetic firm, and she has a work party. So who's going to be at her work party? Well, all the other models, right, dressed to the, dressed to the teeth. And her boyfriend is someone who loves to slouch around in a dirty old T-shirt, you know, thongs and footy shorts and that. And he comes to this work party in a grotty sweatshirt that's about three weeks old, uh, jeans with stains and holes in it, and talking shoes where the top and the bottom have come loose. And he walks to her work party like that. Think she had any reactions to that? What would be some of the words that you might describe her feelings? That he didn't care about her. Okay, well that was, that's how she's thinking that he didn't care, yes. But what are her actual feelings? Anger? Now, anger is a much too mild a word, come on. She was furious. Furious. And not just embarrassed, but mortified. Okay, now the word mortified means so embarrassed you want to go crawl in a rock somewhere. 
So she was mortified and she was furious. And when she asked him, you know, why he did this terrible thing, he said, well, I was comfortable. A bit thick, just slightly. Now, you know, this young man's got a problem, in all seriousness, because he could not identify with the pain of embarrassment because he's never felt embarrassed. This guy has not felt embarrassed. Just water off a duck's back. He's put on a big, real thick hide because strong emotion has so hurt him, he's basically made a vow, I do not want any emotions. So he's killed off his own emotions. He's not in contact with his own feelings. So how is he supposed to identify her pain? Well, he can't. So he can't. So he's got the, he had the opposite of what we call empathy here. He could not read her feelings because he didn't he, he couldn't read his own. I mean that's just uh, how it is. Number three, listen with openness. Listen with openness. We all have trouble setting aside our judgments and opinions, but we cannot learn new things if we're locked into finding fault or stereotyping people. Openness is setting aside our prejudices and hearing what the other person is truly saying. You know, the problem with most marriages is that the husband thinks the wife is a male in a female body. Or vice versa. Especially if I haven't had any siblings about my own age from the opposite sex. So if I'm an only child, my whole experience in my formative years was that human beings are like me. So if I'm a male, I'm going to think that everyone else is going to be the same as me. Egocentric, it's called. And so if I come across a lady, I can be dating with her, and, you know, yeah, it's real good fun, but when I start living with her, then I'm going to think that she should be reacting in the same way I do. You know, in other words, I'm thinking she's a male in a female body. Big mistake. You ladies are not males in female bodies, are you? Now, quite the contrary. You're alien creatures. <laughs> okay. Compared to me. What about you guys say amen to that? No? Amen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, and vice versa. It works both ways. So we need to listen with openness, you know? I mean, I had to work on really hearing what Susan has to say. You know, it doesn't come easy. This stuff is not something that you just are born with, people. You have to use energy to develop it. Number four, listen with awareness. Listen with awareness. How real is the person being? How does what they say fit in with known facts? What are we observing about the behavior of feelings without judging them personally? The Bible encourages us to be aware. In Luke 6 it says, No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart his mouth speaks. By the way, another good verse, another good heart verse. See how important the heart is, people. Awareness is to be conscious of the other person's core messages. That is, A, what are their feelings? So these are some things you should be listening for. What are their feelings? B, what is their experience? Experience. What is their behavior? And D, what is the context of it all? What's the... The, the, the total picture that the feelings and the behavior and the experience all fit into. What's the total picture? H. Listening is more than merely hearing. Listening is more than merely hearing. Number one, attending skills. Okay, attending is a psychological term, so, uh, you know, just sort of bear with us here. It's just a descriptive word. 
and we're going to explain what that means. Attending is nonverbal communication that indicates that you're paying careful attention to the person who's talking. Okay? It's not you saying anything. The way we come across to people is very important. This presence with people call, could be called psychological attention because by our physical presence, the other person feels we are listening. Okay, these skills include A, posture. Now, we've talked a little bit about this already in uh, Unit 1. Posture, good posture includes inclining your body towards the speaker to show your involvement in the conversation. Two, facing the other person squarely. Three, maintaining an open position. Four, positioning yourself at the right distance from the speaker. And Susan will talk to you, or I will talk to you more about uh, the space, you know, physical space, personal space, how close to be with people and what that means. We'll talk a bit about that next session. Uh, B is body motion. Body motion. Or body language, it's also called. Okay, and again, that's uh, what we'll be talking about next session. The way we express ourselves with gestures, head movements, or lack of movement enhances our effective listening. Some gestures can be distracting. You know, if you're waving your arms around too much here, you know, going like that, well, that's going to be distracting, isn't it? You know, you're not going to be listening to me too much. You're judging, probably. Yeah, I think you'll be judging. That's true. Okay, so we're going to talk about body language uh, next, uh, next session, next week. C, eye contact. Eye contact. In our society, eye contact is essential to good attending. Not all cultures are the same, though. So we expect in our culture to people to make eye contact. If you have trouble looking someone in the eye when speaking to them, look at the bridge of their nose at a point near their eyes. True. If you, if you, and I come across people that have trouble making eye contact. If you're shy or you stutter or you know whatever and you're having trouble making eye contact, and you're aware of that, well, you don't actually have to make eye contact. If you look at the bridge of their nose, it, it makes them think you're looking at them. Yeah. It makes them think look, that you're looking at them because it's so close. Okay, most people will read a lack of eye contact as a lack of interest or insecurity on your part. And I think most of the... Yeah, yeah. And it might not be that at all. I mean, you might be just shy, but that's certainly insecurity. You know, but so lack of eye contact is not good. I mean, one of the reasons I had decided to have the laser surgery was to remove my glasses so people could make better eye contact with me. You know, pretty important in my profession. Okay. Uh, D, pleasant environment. Pleasant environment under D. The surroundings that you have a conversation in affect the way you will listen. If there are distractions of noise or movement, conversation will become difficult, like play, people playing the piano out in the hallway. <laughs> okay, even the color of the room, the furnishings, the temperature can all affect the way we listen. Not having physical barriers such as a desk or corner of a wall in front of you will enhance the listening environment. I spent a lot of time trying to th work out how to develop the counseling center downstairs. You know, they, they came up with this green, uh, which they wanted throughout the whole building, and it's, I guess it's not too bad, but psychologically green is actually a good color. You know, it's restful, it's quiet, and uh, it helps people relax. And that's probably why they used it for the whole building. Okay? Um, if you wanted, if you wanted uh, more uh, intimacy, you'd want it more uh, warmth, so pinks and reds and things like that. And if you wanted it more sterile, uh, you do blue and darker colors. So it does have an impact. In summary, attending is the ability to make the other person comfortable with your presence. Egan talks about these abilities as micro skills. Now, Egan is the textbook that most counselors take. It's a counseling skills uh, textbook. And uh, it has its own workbook, and, you know, if you're interested in doing some of your own study, um, uh, get a copy of Egan, 
uh, you know, Kurwang would have it and any Christian bookshop. It's not a Christian book as such, but all the Bible colleges use it for counseling. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Something skills. <laughs> Was it? No, that's by Bolton. That's actually another excellent book, though. People skills is by a guy called Bolton, and it's actually for communication skills. The easiest reading book would be Bolton. People skills. I'd recommend that to you. Is number one. Uh, People skills by Bolton. Uh, it's probably the second. Best one would be messages, um, and the the third one is Egan is more a counseling textbook, but it gives basic counseling skills. Of course, listening, and all these things are one, one of the basics. Okay, uh, he gives us this acronym to help us to remember our attending skills. Now, remember we did this um, in unit one or uh, unit two. Now, by the way, I just might mention this. This unit here, because we, we, we felt that uh, people need broader um, listening and communication skills to be good counselors or for relationships anyhow, that we wanted to extend it. Instead of just one session, which we had in the earlier units, we're going to have four sessions. Now, eventually, that other one session, we're going to eliminate that and put something else there instead. Okay, so this is going to take over. So in years to come, this won't be Unit 9. This actually probably would be Unit 3. So we probably have start out with the counselor, the counseling process, and communication skills, one or two. Those two reversed. I'm not sure. We'll look at that. Okay, so, um, so you know, future people, they're going to, they might, for a couple of years, it might be a duplicate in there somewhere or something like that. Okay, but uh, we've talked about this already. S means facing the person squarely, remember? SOLAR is the acronym here. S for to face the person squarely. O, have an open posture. L, lean slightly forward. Okay, so we got squarely, open, lean. Uh, e, maintain good eye contact. And R, try to be relaxed but alert. Now, recently I've talked to a few people after church, and nothing more disconcerting, I hope you're not one of them that does this to me, but nothing more disconcerting when they stand on the side of you talking to you, and then you turn and they move over. <laughs> you know? And they keep talking to you right out of the corner of your eye. You know, some people do that, you know, and hopefully you're not one of them. Is that something to do with the after-service after environment? <laughs> yeah, well, it could be. I mean, I don't know, but I think I suspect they do that, you know, not just after church. Okay, let's keep uh, rolling here. Number two, following skills. And some of this stuff, by the way, we're going to practice at the workshop. Okay, workshop. The fifth session of this unit, we'll have a workshop like we always do, and we're going to practice some of this stuff. We're going to go over it in more uh, practical kinds of ways. Number two was following skills. Is the new fill-in at the top of page nine. Bolton says, and that's uh, the book uh, People Skills, one of the primary tasks of a listener is to stay out of the other's way so the listener can discover how the speaker views his situation. Now think about that. I think that's a really good statement. My job as a listener is to stay out of the other's way so that he can effectively transmit a statement to me about his situation. Most of us have trouble staying out of the way, usually by asking too many questions or making too many statements. Here are some skills to foster better listening. A. Door openers. Door openers. These are open-ended questions or statements that encourage the other person to talk. 
It could be as simple as care to talk about it. Door openers have some of the following elements. One, a description of the other person's body language. So you, uh, a door opener could be, gee, you're looking a little uh, nervous, or uh, you're looking a bit tired, or uh, you know some comment on their body language. An invitation to talk or continue talking. So, yeah, listen, I'm, I'm interested in what you've got to say here. Keep on talking. Don't stop now. Come on. That could be a door opener. Silence. Giving the other person time to gather thoughts, get in touch with their emotions. One of the co-counselors made a comment. Uh, uh, they were pretty amazed how quiet I was at a particular place in the co-counseling, in the counseling process. And what I was doing is just doing the silence thing. I was giving the other person plenty of time to assemble their thoughts. You know, there's a lot of people that, uh, 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 how can I put it, kind of funny, I guess, but uh, their brain is not running at the same speed as their mouth. You know, sounds funny, but it's true. Some people, their brain is going a thousand miles faster than their mouth is, and that's why some people stutter. Other people, though, uh, their mouth is going a whole lot faster than their brain is. Yeah, true. I mean, this is seriously true. I know it sounds funny, but seriously true. And those people who, you know, who have to process longer, well, I've got to give them that time to do it. And, and interestingly enough, most people don't, uh, don't sense it as awkward when, when you're giving them silence. You might think it's awkward, but they don't. You know, and that's right. They're so busy thinking they don't notice. You know, I went to a wedding fairly recently, and uh, and I was asked to uh, read a scripture for it, and uh, I got a little excited, so I I said it quicker than I wanted to. You know, and uh, you know, if if you've ever been taught public speaking, you should go about half the speed of what is you think is normal. But the people out there don't hear it as half speed. You know, they hear it as good pronunciation and weighty and serious and, you know, good stuff. You know, I just sort of raced through this scripture and I thought, ugh, you know, I didn't do that very well. Because I was listening to me rather than putting myself in their shoes of how they were hearing it. And you can go half the speed and it sounds really weird when the preacher gets up there and he says, You know, Bolton says one of the primary tasks of a listener, (laughs) say, now that might sound a little strange to you, but when you're reading scripture, that's very effective. Okay, silence. The fourth one there is attending, which we've already looked at. Attending is showing that you're interested. That's the psycho babble for showing that you're interested. Okay, B is minimal encouragers. Minimal encouragers. Sorry about some of the psych language here, but it, you know it, it does help uh, those that are you have that are counselors because you've come across some of this stuff before. Minimal encouragers. These are just words or noise we make to show that we're still listening. So. A long word for a short description here. They can be words like yes, go on, really, hmm, 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 yes, mm-hmm. yeah, go on, yeah, okay, yep. Uh, called Rogerian therapy, or per- humanistic psychology, and the original Rogerian therapy was to not say anything at all. You weren't allowed to say anything at all. You just had to sit there, and you could say, mm, and you could nod your head, but you actually weren't allowed to say any words. And then as it went on, they, you know, it got more liberal. But he had incredible results, this guy. You know, people were astound- astounded by his results. And it was that for the first time for many people, they'd been listened to. Just for the first time in their whole life, one person had sat there 
and loved them enough to listen to them for a whole hour. And that was the therapy, that someone had loved them enough to listen for a whole hour. And, you know, I'm staggered by uh, what it said in Job, that when Job was going through all his difficulties, you know, when he'd lost his family, his friends sat with them for three days and said nothing. Act of love. Can you imagine us doing that today in our busy lifestyle? Sitting three days with a person and said nothing. Powerful. So yes, uh, um, love Love is uh, something that we, I think we need to define what love is. You know, because uh, I don't think we know how to love very well. Okay, see, open questions, and then we went on. And um, let's just read that. The infrequent use of questions shows that we're really trying to understand where the other is coming from. A probing question that's not intrusive is seen as expressing an interest. The use of questioning should be carefully used as we can easily direct the conversation by talking too much. Open questions are those that cannot be answered yes or no. That is, they require a more <coughs> elaborate explanation. They allow the speaker to express themselves. Okay, so what would be an example of a closed question? Well, it's just one that you can answer yes or no. Did you go to the footy today? Yes. Well, that's the end of that one. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what people do. They ask a question like that. Uh, if the partner is just a little bit tired or whatever, they say yes. So and they walk on. So what would be a better question? You know, how do you feel about your team losing? <coughs> now, that might get some more response. Or did your team win or lose? They have to. They might need to elaborate. It could, that could be a closed question too. They could just say, "Oh, it lost." You know, but it, it's going to be better than yes or no. If someone can answer your question, yes or no, some will. You know, and that's it. And end of conversation. So try to make your question so that you, they can't answer yes or no. D silence. D is silence. Most of us feel uncomfortable when there's silence in our conversation. However, silence can be a wholesome addition to our listening skill since most listeners talk too much. By giving the other person permission to speak into the silence, we allow them to share with us what is important to them. It may take some time and silence for the other person to assemble what they would like to communicate. Some people are slower or faster with their brain than their mouth. During this time of silence, the listener doesn't have to be inactive. We can attend to the other, that is, uh, allow them to have the impression that we're listening. We can observe the other, and we'll talk more about observation skills next session. Think about what the other wants to share. Gee, conclusion. So you see, there's more to real listening than you may have thought possible. Perhaps the sad part is knowing how little of relationship skills are taught in both the church and our school system today. In summary, let's look at some basic principles you can apply to your listening, taken from messages. Total listening. And this is a quote from that book. People want you to listen, so they look for clues to prove that you are. Here's how to be a total listener. One, maintain good eye contact. Two, lean slightly forward. Three, reinforce the speaker by nodding or paraphrasing. Clarify by asking questions. Actively move away from distractions. So, you know, if someone else is talking close by, you say, come on, just come on over here. That shows that you're really interested. I mean, if there's a distraction there, and both of you are sort of looking at the distraction, well, that means that you're not really interested to them. That's how it's going to come across. And six, be committed, even if you're angry or upset, to understanding what was said. Now, if married couples did that, you know, we'd be light years ahead in our relationships, that last one. Be committed, even though you're angry or upset, to understanding what was said from the other person's point of view. That's hard. You know, when you're fuming there under your collar 
and you're desperate to want to say something really uh, clever or biting, to just bite your tongue and try to really understand what that person said. Okay, homework. Please finish thinking and listing, uh, thinking about and listing your blockages to good listening. You know, the little exercise we started at the recess time. Active listening is no doubt the most important secular skill in counseling. I mean, that's what really, if I don't know the story, if I haven't heard the story, how can I counsel anybody? You know, I've got to get enough information so that I have uh, some sense of where, you know, where I'm going with the whole thing. Okay. And uh, next week we have clear expression. Now, um, these might be slightly different because we're just still writing them. And uh, so we put this out last year, but they might be slightly different. Like body language is going in next week, I think. Uh, it wasn't in tonight, so we'll just see where that all fits. So they might not be exactly in the, the, that order. But because there's, there's five topics, I've got to get into four nights. That's the problem, you know, one of those deals. Okay, well, thanks for coming. Uh, if you could please uh, put... Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, please put the tables away. Uh, that would be great. Elizabeth. I just think that demographic, you know, someone who's uh, been in a way that you should feel, or someone who's been in some something that this is part of Oh, absolutely. Debriefing really is exactly the same as what we're talking about tonight. Um, debriefing is just counseling by another name. It's just letting them speak I out. I've heard of debriefing years ago. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you needed to do it. You bet. Well, okay, but that's, I mean, if we're talking about debriefing, then that would be what they would understand the debriefing to entail. That is, you needing to talk like that. And that's what I was saying. Uh, uh, all of us need to be heard. Uh, women especially need to express themselves in that way because a lot of women are intuitive. See, see, a lot of people, well, intuitive people, and, I mean, there's men that are like this too, of course, but intuitive people um, kind, of, kind of understand what's going on as the words come out of their mouth. Say, so they actually have to talk the solution out. So as they're talking, they go, oh, yeah, that's why that's happening, and that's what's going on here by actually hearing the words out there. Where intellectuals, they assemble all the answers in their head first, and then they can bring it out their mouths. But, but intuitives actually work out the solutions while they're talking. See? So if I, if I don't give an intuitive the opportunity to talk, uh, they stay in confusion. See? That's one of the problems. So it's a different people. You know, weird, people are weird, aren't they? You know, God, God love us, thankfully. Amen. Do you come across many men intuitive like that? Uh, not in that sense. I, I come across spiritually sensitive men and emotionally sensitive men, but not too many men that have to talk it out that way. Now, what about you? I'm just discovering that I'm not that way. You are that way. Yes. Yeah, okay. More yeah. and more. Yeah. Daniel, yeah. Do, you, do you think that it's possible that quite a lot of men would think that their wives are crazy if they're that way inclined, if they're intuitive? And the wives end up, end up getting confused because they can't talk it out. Because the wives can't talk it out, or the husbands no, can't talk it out. The wife can't talk it out. Yes. That type of person. Yes. And so then she goes into confusion. Oh, yeah. Is that what causes yeah. guys oh. to think you're crazy? Oh, yeah, yeah. sure. Because, uh, I mean, men are going to cut women off like that instead of letting them chew their ears. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the wife then thinks, well, there's something wrong with me. Sure. And that'll cause confusion. You bet. Okay, uh, thanks for coming, and uh, if you can help us put away things, that would be lovely.